Good afternoon. My name is Samantha Payne. I'm the treasurer for the Environmental Law Society, and I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists for the topic air quality and public health. Our first panelist is Professor Tolan. Professor Tolan joined the WMU Cooley Law School faculty in 2013, teaching environmental law and several other courses at the school's Tampa Bay, Florida campus. Previously, he taught for more than 10 years, teaching a diverse array of subjects as a tenured professor at Barry University School of Law in Orlando, Florida, and in the Department of Law at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado. He has also published widely in the fields of federal tax, alternative dispute resolution, environmental law, and government contract law and litigation. After 21 years of Air Force service, Professor Tolan retired in 2005 from his position as the staff judge advocate at Hanscom Air Force Base in Massachusetts, where he was the senior legal advisor to the installation commander. As a judge advocate, he had a wide array of legal experiences, including both civil and criminal litigation. Professor Tolan served as a senior environmental attorney at several Air Force bases and provided comprehensive legal advice on the full spectrum of environmental issues, from asbestos to lead-based paint abatement to Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, CERCLA, and RICRA compliance. Highlights of his military career include successful defense of a $2 billion environmental claim against the Air Force, selection by the Air Force Material Command for the Team Excellence Award, and recognition by the Governor of New Mexico with the Green Zia Award for Environmental Stewardship. Please welcome Professor Tolan. Thank you. I think you can all see my head. At least that uh, part of me is digitally in the room with you. So I wish I could be there my whole body. Um, I know a lot of friends from the environmental community are there. I wish I could be there to interact and, and have lunch and catch up. And I'm sure we can do that offline. Um, today I'll just be talking about Clean Air Act. Uh, my own personal opinion is to some of the deficiencies in the Clean Air Act as it's been implemented. I call it chinks in the Clean Air Act armor health risks to the most vulnerable. And as mentioned, I'm currently at Cooley Law School. Um, the views reflected here, of course, are my own and not those of the institution. Oops. Well, I've lost you. Hopefully you can still see me. The definition of uh, chinks in the armor is basically a small cleft slit or fissure or a weak spot that may leave one vulnerable. The idea of uh, a chink in the armor here, I think, Clean Air Act has gone a long way to provide cleaner air for our nation. So it's not like we're out there naked. We've actually got the suit of armor. But there are still some weak spots that do leave individuals vulnerable, especially children, the elderly, um, individuals with breathing difficulties. Um, the most vulnerable segments of, segments of our population are still subject in non-attainment areas to the risks of air pollution. All right, so I wanted to go through just a little bit of background on the Clean Air Act, uh, a little bit of the history as to how we got to where we are today. Essentially, the focus will be on the cooperative federalism, the federal government establishing mobile emission controls and national ambient air quality standards, while the state's responsible for the implementation through its permitting scheme and in other mechanisms to attain those ambient air quality standards. Um, one of the key features is the uh, requirements for new sources to meet demanding technological standards in terms of clean air. Um, what I wanted to note is some of the lingering non-attainment problems and some of the health issues related with that. What I perceive to be the chinks in the armor at the federal level in terms of state implementation shortcomings and also overall individuals' resistance to lifestyle change. So if we look at the uh, the Clean Air Act, uh, we're normally referring to the Clean Air Act of 1970, which is the federalization of air pollution control. The Clean Air Act of 1970 were not the first federal foray, however, into air pollution. So we do have some vestiges that find their way into the Clean Air Act scheme. Uh, significantly, the idea of criteria that had been developed by the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare at the time, now Health and Human Services, to try to determine just what uh, safe levels were for air. In terms of criteria, those are now reflected in the criteria pollutants under the Clean Air Act. The Air Quality Act of 1967 
directed the states to establish air quality control regions based on top topographical and geographical considerations. These don't necessarily respect political boundaries, although most reporting is done on a county by county basis. The focus of today's presentation will be the Clean Air Act of 1970, as amended in 77 and uh, 1990. Uh, significantly, again, we have federal fuel emission standards for vehicles. This is the EPA ability to regulate mileage uh, requirements for vehicles, to regulate fuel content for mobile sources. We also have the national health-based National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or NACs, for stationary sources, which are implemented by state implementation plans, or SIPs. The uh, new source performance standards are a way to ensure that the best control technology possible is introduced as new sources come online. This is the first chink in the armor of the Clean Air Act. Old sources were initially grandfathered so that they didn't have to meet any technological standards whatsoever. And this may have made sense back in 1970 when Congress had imagined that all the air would be clean by 1975, but in retrospect, 45 years later, it doesn't seem that that's the case. And the old uh, grandfathered sources have a considerable economic advantage to keep strapping on uh, repairs to their existing facilities instead of investing in the new, much more effective pollution control measures. Uh, second chink in the armor is at the federal level, we're looking at limited pollutants that are covered. The original criteria pollutants, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, ground level ozone and its constituents, basically hydrocarbons and uh, nitrous oxides and also uh, carbon monoxide. Those were the only original um, criteria pollutants. We only have had one pollutant added since then. That was a result of litigation. Lead was added and there haven't been any additional pollutants listed since then. Also initially in 1970, we only had seven hazardous air pollutants regulated. Um, in 1990, Congress was fed up with the pace of EPA in addressing these hazardous um, air pollutants and added 187 to a list statutorily and directed EPA to add 24 per year as additional hazardous air pollutants subject to regulation. The third chink in the armor derives from the state implementation plans. Essentially, the EPA sets the standard, but the state is at liberty to impose its own control measures. And it can over-regulate, under-regulate, as long as it meets the uh, ultimate goals, it can choose not to regulate at all certain emission sources. And, and when I talk about emission sources, I'm talking about the stationary sources that are subject to the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. So the states have the opportunity to impose restrictions that are very costly on certain industries. Um, they even can put a, a particular uh, business um, out of business by imposing a, a cost to that business that it can't afford. But again, as long as they meet the requirements at the bottom line for the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, the SIPs are beyond the scope of uh, federal control. Um, finally, another chink in the armor would be that the criteria that are being measured are moving targets. As science evolves, as we discover that these uh, criteria pollutants are health, are health hazards in even lower doses, the standards have been modified. Um, significantly, we've added smaller particulate matter, uh, referred to oftentimes as PM 2.5. We've changed the ozone standard from a one hour standard to an eight hour standard. The standards for lead have been revised um, from 1978 up to 2008 to more uh, demanding standards with regard to lead emissions. And science tends to show that even smaller exposures are hazardous. Um, as 1977 rolled around, the goals of the Clean Air Act had not been realized. The significant new addition was then to recognize that some areas of the country were in attainment and some areas of the country were not in attainment. So the uh, prevention of significant deterioration provisions of the new statute prevented the um, states basically from undermining those areas that were already in attainment. For example, to lure industry from another state. Um, also, the areas that were in non-attainment then were facing more stringent control requirements and tighter deadlines. In non-attainment areas, all uh, 
potential new construction or modification of the facility would have to undergo uh, permitting before the construction could begin. The key concern there was what's the definition of a major stationary source. And in the uh, PSD regions, typically 250 tons per year or 100 tons per year in the non-attainment areas. Those um, definitions of major were ratcheted down in 1990. So now as little as 10 tons per year of ozone may be con considered a major stationary source or a major modification. Again, by 1990, we still had not realized the goals of the Clean Air Act. Um, some of the confounding factors were the long distances that uh, constituents could travel and the ozone transport region evolved as a mechanism for the East Coast to deal with pollution that originated largely in the Midwest. A complex permitting program was introduced under Title V. Tighter constraints on vehicle emissions under Title II were imposed as a federal requirement. As I mentioned before, Congress entered into the uh, regulation of hazardous air pollutants by prescribing a list of multiple pollutants that had to be regulated as part of the permitting program before those sources uh, could come online. For geographic areas now, um, we're looking at classification based on whether or not they meet the NAC. If the uh, states have met the NACs, we're in a uh, PSD situation where any new or major modified source would have to undergo new source review to show that it doesn't unduly degrade the quality of the air in that region. For the other areas in 1990, ozone, for example, was broken down into subcategories such as extreme noncompliance for ozone, severe, serious, moderate, or marginal. And in addition to the different definitions for what constitutes a major source, the um, requirements for offsets in those areas were more extreme in terms of the more, um, the more out of compliance the area was. For example, in extreme areas, a 1 to, uh, 1 1.5 to 1 offset was required, meaning for every additional 100 tons of pollutants emitted, 150 tons of pollution in that same air quality region had to be retired. Um, what this led to is uh, general schemes, both in the ozone transport region and in other state areas for uh, emissions trading, so that uh, sources that wanted to come online that needed to obtain permission to pollute would have to secure that by encouraging other existing industries to reduce their pollution. This graph here shows the most recent statistics from EPA in terms of counties that are designated as non-attainment. If you look at the graph, you'll notice that most of the non-attainment areas uh, are focused on areas of large uh, metropolitan areas, urban areas, population centers. And obviously, you're going to have a consolidation of emission sources in larger cities that you're not going to find in rural areas both in terms of mobile sources as well as stationary sources. The good news, of course, is Florida. If you look at Florida, basically in compliance, except where I am here in Hillsborough County, adjacent to uh, Tampa Bay, where we're in non-compliance for lead and SO2. Our uh, FIP has us coming into compliance in uh, 2015. We will see whether that happens for lead and for SO2, our SIP call um, with our revised standards for SO2 is due next month. So what, what's the problem with non-attainment? Well, when we look at the criteria of pollutants and the associated health, health risks, we can see that there's an increased incidence and in severity of respiratory disease for particulate matter and also the constituents of ozone, um, nitrous oxide, and um, also the hydrocarbons, which are very small materials which can get deep into the lungs and can exacerbate existing lung conditions such as asthma. Um, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide are components of acid rain, so those can lead to cross-contamination of the nation's waters. Um, also, they generate fine particulate matter, which poses the same respiratory problems. Carbon monoxide you're probably familiar with. You probably have a uh, carbon monoxide warning um, monitor in your house that will go off, known as the uh, silent killer. Carbon monoxide basically replaces oxygen in the bloodstream where you 
would potentially go to sleep and never wake up. And most of you are probably familiar with the adverse effects of lead, especially in children. As a neurotoxin, there's adverse impacts on the brain, causing developmental and attention deficit disorders, as well as long-term adverse uh, impacts on brain development in terms of reduced IQs in children. So who's most at risk? Um, right now, our urban children are the most vulnerable, um, especially those that are active outdoors in the city. So if we have an ozone e um, episode or a, a heat event in the city, we have obvious impact on the individuals that suffer from asthma. Ozone has also, in some studies, been suggested as a potential trigger for heightened development of asthma based on chronic exposure in high ozone areas. Obviously, the breathing difficulties impact the lungs, and uh, what I wanted to do is just spend a second looking at, at a uh, deeper level as to what the impact is. The blue on the screen there is essentially the white blood cells trying to respond to the inflammation in the airways. It's been described in uh, common terms as having a sunburn on the inside of your airways, and if you can imagine the irritation and the constriction that would accompany the sunburn. In the alveoli on the uh, left-hand side of the screen, what happens with asthma victims is they try to harvest as much o oxygen as they can. So the alveoli capture more oxygen and swell up. The swelling factor causes wheezing, coughing, respiratory difficulties, and aggravates the factors of asthma, resulting in more emergency room vis uh, visits and could ultimately threaten the individual that suffers from asthma. Um, the reason that I'm concerned about this especially is because of increased population and increased urbanization that's projected for Florida. The latest Florida census shows that the population is doubling between 1970 and 2040. In uh, Duval County out there in uh, Jacksonville, um, the population is increasing at double the national rate. We're seeing uh, 40 to 50 percent more people in Florida cities by 2040 than now, um, basically 50% more population, which will contribute to these air pollution problems. In addition, we have increased heat events. Uh, based on climate change, we expect that heat events will continue. Uh, if you recall last summer, there were a, a number of heat events. Uh, people were warned to stay indoors. This is nothing new in, in cities like Los Angeles, where they've had smog alerts and similar warnings issued throughout time. but um, in many metropolitan areas, I'm sure you've heard of the problems in China. Um, in India this year, in, in June, Delhi experienced ozone levels at double its normal ozone levels during that summer heat wave, um, up to double the safe limit for ozone. Um, another reason to be concerned is that birth rates in Florida are climbing. As we have more children, we're adding to that group that's most vulnerable, both for asthma and other developmental exposure, um, brain development, lung development, all that makes the, uh, the children more vulnerable. And also everyone knows that Florida is a, a haven for the retirement community. As the population in Florida ages, and we're expected to increase the uh, aged population over age 65 by 50 percent between now and 2030, as more elderly are added to our uh, composition of our population, we'll have a larger vulnerable group within our society. So the challenges, and I'll wrap it up, I know I'm probably running out of time, there are to um, protect asthmatics and those with respiratory illness or weaknesses will continue to remain a challenge. Science often shows that we initially underestimate the threats. Um, we've had to upgrade the criteria standard several times already. Exposures to toxic releases and fugitive emissions are not well regulated. They're not part of the typical SIP plans. We've got uh, gas-operated lawnmowers, leaf blowers, et cetera, that are in most cases not regulated at all. We've got the toxic release inventory, which shows accidental release of uh, toxic airborne pollutants such as naphthalene, et cetera, that continue to um, add to the pollution problems. Uh, much like the Clean Water Act, the low-hanging fruit has been harvested. Um, the measures that remain are going to be controversial. They're going to perhaps involve lifestyle changes like mass transportation, which at least in the uh, South Coast Air Quality Management District in Los Angeles have been heavily contested. And also we're going to have increased expense. And so industry could be expected to fight back, particularly um, as the cost of control become higher. 
that wraps up the uh, the formal part of my presentation. I don't know whether we're going to do questions at the end or um, whether it's appropriate for questions. Our next panelist is Professor Gellers. Professor Gellers is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at the University of North Florida, an honorary fellow at the South Asia Institute of Advanced Studies in Nepal. He is also a lead Green Associate. His research focuses on constitutional environmental rights and sustainable development. Josh's work has appeared in the Journal of Environmental Law and Litigation, Journal of Human Rights and the Environment, Review of Policy Research, Sustainability Science, and Transnational Environmental Law. He has also consulted for the United Nations Development Program and Sierra Club Green Home. Josh runs Enviro Rights Map, a Google Maps based website which catalogs environmental rights throughout the world. He holds a BA in Political Science from the University of Florida, an MA in Climate and Society from Columbia University, and an MA and PhD in Political Science from UC Irvine. Please welcome Professor Gellers. So I'd uh, like to thank Professor Hull, Florida Coastal School of Law, Jacksonville University, and the Environmental Law Society for having me here. I apologize if my voice is uh, a little bit lacking. I'm still recovering from a conference in New Orleans last week. So <clears throat> with further, without further ado, uh, my talk is going to be a little bit more focused on upscaling the relationship between some of the topics that we've been discussing today, uh, mainly indoor environmental quality with a specific emphasis on air quality, uh, human rights at the national and international level, and then green buildings as a potential salve for being able to provide people with a means of achieving the kinds of quality of life and health necessary to see that all of their human rights are adequately fulfilled. So first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my area of expertise, uh, the focus of my dissertation, which is on environmental rights. And to understand the possibilities that lie within environmental rights, as well as the rights to health and housing, and how they may accommodate pursuits of better indoor environmental quality. And so in terms of the right to the environment, if we're looking at it from a linguistic, legalistic perspective, the way in which environmental rights have been phrased within constitutions varies widely, but they all seem to suggest some quality of the environment that we're seeking to protect, whether it's an ecologically balanced, a clean, a safe, a healthful. So there's lots of different uh, measures of description which provide us with some ambiguous means of it, trying to interpret what an environmental right actually means. And in that case, what I'm gonna argue is that that is actually beneficial for the purpose of broadening the scope of environmental rights to include not only the natural environment, of which we're all probably well aware, but the built environment as well. And so there's a few cases in particular that I wanted to highlight which demonstrate the ability or the flexibility of environmental rights to be expanded beyond just the natural environment. And so in one case of Funde Publico uh, in, in the country of Colombia, the uh, Supreme Court decided that environmental rights encompassed not only relate those relating to the natural environment, but they set of basic conditions for all mankind. Uh, in an, a case before the Indian Supreme Court in Subhash Kumar, the Supreme Court of India decided that uh, individuals would have to be uh, per given some kind of protection for potentially anything that could endanger their quality of life, and that would be protected under Article 32 of the Indian Constitution. And then finally, in HTF developers, uh, a, a court case which came out of the High Court of South Africa, the concept of well-being was discussed in terms of human rights, and it was left by the judges to be an open-ended uh, concept which could not be manifestly defined, although some legal scholars have taken it upon themselves to suggest that the built environment could also be considered part of what it means to have well-being. Moving on to the right to health for a moment, this was a right that first came about uh, in its legal instantiation at the international level in 1946 in the World Health Organization's Constitution. And in particular, uh, it has then seen its, uh, it has seen itself to be promulgated in other international fora, 
like most notably the International Covenant on Economic, Civil, uh, Social, Cultural Rights, uh, Article uh, 16 of the African Charter, Article 10 of the Additional Protocol to the American Convention on Human Rights, and over 100 constitutions throughout the world. So it is vastly accepted in the uh, realm of international norms and human rights that the right to health is among those corpus of laws. But more specifically, if we look at the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, Article 12.2b specifically addresses this issue, and, and it in particular notices that the full realization of the right to health requires the improvement of all aspects of environmental and industrial hygiene. So we can surmise from that that this is rather a broad construction. Uh, it has also been mentioned in the constitutions mentioned here, uh, the uh, Honduran Constitution of 1982 in Article 145, and the Polish Constitution uh, of 1997 under Article 68. And additionally, case law has also provided us with additional understanding of how the right to health links up with these other rights, like the right to environment. In a famous case coming out of the Philippines, Minors of Hosa, the right to uh, a balanced and healthful ecology which is under Article or Section 16 of the Constitution, was said by the Supreme Court to unite with the right to health under Section 15. And then at the regional level in Africa, uh, in the Serac case, which dealt with uh, uh, oil exploration in Nigeria, the African Commission held that Articles 16 and 24 of the African Charter mandate that governments desist from directly threatening health and the environment of their citizens. So clearly there are antecedents for understanding a relationship between various human rights, such as the right to health and the right to the environment that provide us with some additional leverage over deciding how we can go about legislating that in a way that's more concrete to move beyond some of the criticisms that have been levied against rights like the right to environment, which have been challenged on the grounds that they're simply too ambiguous to be fully implemented at the national level. And so the third piece to this is the right to housing. And here, again, looking back into history, it was first mentioned at the international level in 1948 in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, and in particular, Article 25, Section 1. It has subsequently been recognized in other international human rights instruments, like the ICSCR Article 11.1, uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 17, Section 1, and the Convention Against the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, Article 14, 2, Section H, among others as well, which I have included in, in my paper, which is available online. And the, world, the WHO's Health Principles of Housing, which is actually used by the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights to explain the content of the right to housing, further specifies the kinds of content and the explicit forms of implementation that one should look to if they're trying to adequately enforce the right to housing. And so the uh, WHO document mentions in particular that gov governments should guard against indoor air pollution as a specific way of addressing uh, issues associated with health and housing. Uh, in addition, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights has further explained the relationship uh, and the content of the right to housing in their general comments 4 and 14. General comment 4 specifically talks about habitability. What does it mean for individuals to successfully and healthfully inhabit some place where they are living? And they mentioned uh, in, in comment 4 that it protects from threats to health. So that specifically ties housing to health. And then in general comment 14, it mentions that environmental conditions and housing are both to be considered in concert as determinants of health as well. And this is not only to mention uh, international legal instruments, but as you can see from the final bullet point here, this kind of a right, the right to housing, has been implemented or adopted in 40% of the constitutions throughout the world. One particular example I'd like to highlight uh, is from Article 48, Section 1 of the 1990 Sao Tome and Principe Constitution, which specifically notices the linkages between housing and the environment. So what does this look like when we're trying to understand 
the reciprocity between these rights, how they all relate to one another, how does this give us any additional purchase on being able to implement these rights, being able to find a way of addressing them through international institutions, through national legal instruments and institutions. So what I've constructed here is how I view the relationship between the three human rights that I've just mentioned, the right to health, the right to housing, and the right to the environment. And then at the bottom, I've expanded the notion of what it means to have a, an environment by focusing not only on the natural environment, which we are already, is already well established in case law and literature, but to begin a conversation about expanding what it means to talk about the environment in terms of the built environment as well. As you can see from the evidence provided earlier, as well as the graphic provided here, the right to housing is intimately intertwined with health and the environment. And so we need only expand our knowledge of, or, ex or our conception of the environment to begin to include other aspects of it, including the structures all around us, which we take for granted as existing most often outside or, at, or perhaps even within the natural environment as well, as well. So I think that we should take a more holistic view and to understand these rights in the framework of the broader physical environment as opposed to merely looking at housing purely as the domain of the built environment and the right to the environment or the right to health, focusing solely on those aspects which are external to human experience. So how does this relate to the more fine-grained issue of indoor environmental quality and air quality? Well, research has demonstrated that in the developed world, people spend approximately 90% of their waking hours indoors. Perhaps some of that's outdoors if they're camping. So the point is that if we're going to focus on how these different human rights relate to one another, we need to understand the reality, and that is that most people are spending most of their time indoors. So it makes sense to focus on the built environment as well as the natural environment. And so as I've just shown before, we have these obvious connections between human rights to the environment, to health and housing, and these are affected in particular indoor environmental quality by sources which are found both internal and external. So indoor sources as well as outdoor sources. And indoor environmental quality can negatively affect occupants' health, specifically through poor air quality. So how does this relate back to human rights and green buildings? Well, research has demonstrated that 40% of all illnesses can be traced to buildings and homes. Green buildings, based on the criteria through which they're designed and implemented, have demonstrably better indoor environmental quality than non-green buildings. And so if you look to some examples of voluntary adoption systems like uh, leadership in energy and environmental design, and specifically the IEQ, or indoor environmental quality uh, credits and prerequisites, there are many of them which address indoor environmental quality, especially air quality issues, uh, including uh, issues with, like, for example, uh, providing baselines for minimum air quality performance, which is a required uh, prerequisite, as well as completely eliminating all environmental tobacco smoke, uh, which is also a required measure. And in addition, there are other measures as well, which applicants for the rating system can apply for points under things like using low emitting materials that have uh, low usage of volatile organic compounds, uh, developing a construction plan for indoor uh, air quality management, and so forth. So how does this, how can we take all this knowledge, these relationships between human rights, and put them to practice? What is the meaning behind all of these lessons that we can draw from this lecture? The first is that by utilizing a broader understanding of environmental rights, we can provide a new rights-based mechanism for victims of indoor environmental harms. Because as I mentioned previously, most of the litigation that has been conducted on environmental rights has mainly focused on the natural environment, but not necessarily the built environment. Also, again, to uh, combat the charges that environmental rights are just pie in the sky, uh, paper tigers that no one has any business implementing, by adopting an approach that recognizes the relationship between health and housing, we can offer specific measurable criteria for the implementation of environmental rights. And then finally, from these soup of considerations, I have uh, inferred 
a responsibility to adopt sustainable building practices that exist in international law. Because if you take the goals of the rights to health, the rights to housing, and the rights to the environment together, it suggests that one way of addressing air quality issues by looking at things like indoor environmental quality uh, will provide individuals with uh, the, the means of achieving the fulfillment of all three of these human rights in tandem. That's all the time I have for right now. Thank you for your uh, attention, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gellers. Our final panelist is Steve Pace. Mr. Pace serves as the Senior Environmental Engineering Manager for the City of Jacksonville. In that capacity, he oversees the city's sections on air pollution control, noise pollution control, groundwater, and wetlands and wildlife. He is responsible for negotiating contracts and grants to maintain pollution control efforts, providing technical review and assessment for power plant siting projects, hazardous material response efforts, Title V permitting <coughs> issues, noise pollution control, and other special projects. Previously, Mr. Pay served as the Chief of the Air Quality Division for the City of Jacksonville, where he managed all aspects of a highly diverse countywide air pollution control program, structured ozone redesignation efforts that achieved county rate designation from non-attainment to attainment, and initiated a mobile air toxic laboratory to assess localized impacts from industrial sources. He received a degree in electrical design engineering technology from Pennsylvania State University and has been certified as a Florida professional engineer since 1979. Please welcome Mr. Pace. Good afternoon. I'm batting cleanup, I guess. There were only three of us, but Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak today. You've heard a number of speakers, Dr. Uh, Dr. Wells, Dr. Tolan, talk about air pollution somewhat on a larger scale. I would like to take you lower upon the scale. I'd like to talk to you about what happens at the local level uh, relative to air pollution and air quality. From the local level, our team, the Environmental Quality Division, has 870 square miles to cover. We have a population of about 840,000 people we're trying to protect. And we try and do that by regulating the air quality. At our level, we try and do that through permitting the sources. We make sure that every source that we have in Duval County that is a pollution source has a permit. We make sure that it meets all the established rules and regulations. We follow that up by ensuring that we inspect them to make sure they comply. And then we go out and we have ambient air monitoring, where you heard national ambient air quality standards. But we monitor those in order that we see if everyone's in compliance. It's a very difficult job. Very complex. Air pollution um, monitoring takes time, takes money, takes effort. But we are trying to ensure that the community is not exposed to an air quality that will damage their health. And we can only do it to the point that it's regulated. We would love to be able to, to go after air toxins. You heard that. It's not regulated. We have the six criterion pollutants, and as you heard, they're established for the primary standard, which is to address the public health for both the sensitive groups, the elderly, the young, but there are also secondary standards of the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, and those are designed to protect visibility, trying to protect against crop damage, plant damage, and also not affect buildings. So you have these standards, and they're reassessed supposedly every five years. And I say five because it usually takes longer than that.
but they utilize the best information. And you've heard that. We, or the standards, have to use the best knowledge available at that time. And as our knowledge improves, we're going to see reductions in the concentrations that are allowable, and that's what we can then enforce. One of the interesting things about trying to convey to the public the air quality is the fact that when we talk, start talking about national ambient air quality standards, they're in micrograms per cubic meter, they're in parts per billion. Most of the people aren't going to appreciate what that means. And, and for example, raise your hand. Did everybody think about who thought of air quality this morning when they first wrote, woke up? No. But as you've heard, air quality affects each and every one of us every day. How we, how we get to work. What happens to us as we're going to work. What kind of industries are in our area? What kind of impacts those industries have on us each and every day? So when we talk about air quality and trying to convey that, we've, the EPA has come up with an air quality index. And we try and get that out to the public every single day. And you can go online and see what it is using Air Now. It's, it's very easily obtained off the internet. <clears throat> and you can see what the air quality is for Jacksonville or for other cities. And you can then judge what kind of activities you wish to pursue during that day. So air quality is just one of our major efforts, one of the things that we're trying to do every day to protect the community's health. Now let me shift and go back in time. Before there was standards, before there were um, national ambient air quality standards before we knew that it was affecting people's health as well as we do today. One of the most famous incidents in Duval County is in 1949. 1949, you had women downtown walking around and they would sense this tingling sensation on their legs. And they would look down and they would find that their stockings, their nylon stockings, were dissolving. Now think about that for a second. Nylon stockings are dissolving. Life sent a team down to look and find out what it was. And the New York Times reported, and I won't quote it exactly, but it said, gee whiz, the women, all they lost were some nylon hoses, whereas they still have their health. Today, we wouldn't write that. To be exposed to that kind of concentration would have both short-term and long-term impacts on your health because the impacts were from probably speculating JEA Southside and a mobile electric generating plant that was at the foot of Laura, Laura Street. The fuels that they were using at that time would have been high in sulfur, would only taken a little bit of moisture, relative humidity, you'd had sulfuric acid mist, Voila, dissolving, dissolving nylon stockings. The impact of doing that went across the nation. That is probably one of the more famous incidents of, of air pollution in Jacksonville. But we also had another incident in 1978. In 1978, the port, who was bringing in thousands and thousands of cars, started noticing that the cars were staining. The stains wouldn't come off. Can you imagine what the impact would that be to all the dealers? You get a brand new car. Can't got spots on it. Not what you're looking for. Not the custom paint job that you want. Consultants are called in. People are running around trying to figure out what it is. Eventually, it's discovered that it's the result of Alton Box and J.E.A. Kennedy. The soot that comes from their facility because of the type of fuel they were burning at the time was impacting these cars. Now I want you to know we were ahead of our time at that time. Because some of the cars that they were bringing in were Jaguars. They were stained, they couldn't be stole, sold. So staff 
said, we'll take him and use him as staff cars. You know, they didn't see it. We were so far ahead of our time, they couldn't see letting us use those cars. They couldn't sell them, so let us have Jaguars as staff cars. Uh, they didn't see the humor in it at the time. The port, even though the sources changed their operation, the port moved from Talleyrand all the way out to Blunt Island, but they still didn't escape pollution problems. They still had fallout dust problems that were affecting the cars that took quite a while to resolve. But that was a major, major issue in Jacksonville with the staining of those vehicles. And probably the most significant of the environmental air quality issues, and hopefully most of you can remember this, 1984. This now will deal with something that's not the, the classical, classical <coughs> air quality issue. We're not talking about national ambient air quality standards, which we normally talk about air quality. We're now going to talk about others. 1984, there is a documentary published, and, that, and it was aired on TV, and it said, here's what's going on in Jacksonville. The odors are horrible. They were talking and interviewing people. And one of the politicians said, when he was asked, what do you think about the odors? It smells like money. So that's where the title came. It was a reflection of the fact that you had a very industrial complex in Jacksonville. You had two craft pulp mills. You had two CST processing chemical plants. You had a resin uh, production facility, and you had a number of sewage treatment plants, all of which contributed to the odors in Jacksonville, all of which contributed to a downgrading of the quality of life or the air quality in Jacksonville and people were getting tired of it. It affected how they thought of themselves and nationally it actually made jeopardy. It was a question, what southern town stuck? And Jacksonville was the correct answer. People, oh my gosh, five minutes, uh, people in, in Jacksonville when they were flying over, could smell Jacksonville. It hurt the quality of life of people in Jacksonville. In 1988, then elected Tommy Azuri as mayor, declared war on odors. We had odor patrols. Once people knew that there was something that could be done, we received over. 4,500 complaints of voters. 4,500 complaints of voters in a year. That's tremendous. But the thing that was really tremendous is that the Environmental Protection Board, once given the authority, given the resources, was able to come up with a plan that allowed us to, cl to clean up the odor problem in Jacksonville. And some believe and have stated that that's one of the thing reasons that we got an NFL team. Again, going to quality of life, jobs, and having an improvement in, quote, air quality. Jacksonville has had its own problems with particulate. Back in the day when it was total suspended particulate, which was 100 microns, <clears throat> we had an operation downtown. Downtown was putting out 700 micrograms per cubic meter on a 24-hour battery average. What did that really mean? When you consider that the standard was 75, you're over eight times the standard. That's what people were being exposed to. That was what was causing damage to judges' cars in the parking lot of the courthouse. Trust me, that was getting attention. Judges were not happy. So we were able to get that. How did we do that? We worked with the industry and got them to use hydroblasting rather than grit blasting. We also were non-attainment for ozone for a short period of time. And we were able to resolve that by going to vehicle inspections, 
lowering the VOC content in paints and coatings, and also going to what's called stage one vapor recovery, where you fill up a tank with gasoline, those vapors are emitted. Those vapors come out, go into the end of the atmosphere, react, create ozone. Well, we had them capture those vapors out of the, when they were displaced from the tanks, taking them back to the refine, refinery and either flare them or recycle them. Again, that was an improvement. They were able to actually make money on that when they were recycling. Um, since I'm running out of time, I'll simply mention that we're not through face, facing problems with air quality. As the technology increases, we're going to see reductions in the standards. We'll have to modify our uh, approach to air quality in order that we can protect this community and do so as efficiently as we possibly can. We maintain 12 monitoring sites throughout the 870 plus square miles of Duval County. 12 monitoring sites. I don't have all five or all six, because, well, all five. We don't do lead, because lead is, we don't have a lead source. All, all five monitors don't, aren't, all criteria and pollutants aren't in those uh, sites. But we have real-time analysis, one real-time analysis, so we can see it. And is, as we see the air quality degrading, we are able to put out alerts that says we're going to approach the standard. Modify your activities accordingly. If we see that it's going to exceed the standard, we put out an air pollution episode. And with an air pollution episode, we're telling you, the, the, the public community, we're going to violate the standard. You need to adjust your activities accordingly. And so as a local approved air pollution program, that is how we approach trying to protect air quality and the quality of life of this community. And I really appreciate your time and your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much.